open up uh, to questions if anybody wants to comment or Gordy, if you want to say something, because yeah, Gordy introduced you, you know, anyone else? Yeah, we, we just a question and answer time if you like, and you go whatever direction you like. Um, yeah, I, I heard about Jim uh, maybe over 10 years ago. There was a, I got a video from, um, from uh, a Christian ministry that was trying to help people that were abductees, and Jim was part of the video. So that's how, um, when I, when I, that was when I met uh, um, Al Matthews, and I gave the video where Jim was in the video to Al, and then Al and, um, Al and Jim uh, were able to talk on the phone, and uh, so Jim was able to help Al, um, you know, find deliverance from the abduction thing because he was still quite paranoid. Audience, uh, who, who, uh, Al Matthews, um, I discovered him, I taught, taught a class on UFOs at the New Westminster um, School Board. It's on the suburbs here in Vancouver in 2009. He took my class and then I started the UFO meetup and he came to the UFO meetup and then he met Gordy and all of us is around 2009. He was abducted in, in his car in Quebec. It's an amazing story. Yes. So Jim uh, really helped Al to um, get rid of his paranoia and to turn to Christ uh, for help. And so um, I spoke to Al recently. He, his computer uh, it doesn't have internet right now, but it, uh, he told me to say hello and, and remind uh, everybody. Yeah, that, I love that, uh, much. We should that, get Al on and invite him that, to. That, that Jim be a guest speaker. Uh, really did, did try to counsel and help him and, and, and the counseling, counseling was, work, was help, helpful. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Al's not paranoid anymore about the abduction phenomenon. He's not getting abducted anymore. So thank you, Jim, for helping him. It was my pleasure, man. He's a good guy. So anything else, guys? Uh, you know, some of the. I mean, I. You know, weirdness has been my twenty four seven for probably a lot of years. So we probably got a lot of shared experiences from what you guys have experienced and what I've experienced also. You um, mentioned. You mentioned when you return a couple of times, it seems a belief that you have, <clears throat> and I can't deny that it's not true, that when you do come back after you lose your life, you'll have the ability somehow to come back and review the things that you have mysteriously done at different times and find yes. answers to them at that time. So I'm yes. just wondering where that comes from. That's a, I don't know what you would call it. I think it's a, it's a really entertaining idea. But I don't know how much in listening to you just now, how much I would adopt, adapt to that or I would how much I would take from that. I'm just wondering well, how it developed in you. Sorry. Well, I, I think that the closer you are to death, the more you appreciate your life, the more you reflect on, you know, there's so many variables that you have no control over. Um, even as a Christian, you know, I, I, I would like to say that, you know, my my fate with uh, with eternity is sealed by trusting in him and what he did for me. But one thing that's never guaranteed, when I'm going to go and necessarily how I'm going to go. That's totally up to God. And so that's where my faith and my trust has to be. But I think after being so close to death, more of life, every precious moment is, is more real. It's more alive. You appreciate and you value that time that, hey, I'm still breathing. I can make a chance. I mean, especially the times when maybe you make a mistake or you're in the lower you know, point of your life, you remember, hey, you're still alive. Things can change. There's always a hope. Um, I, I had a very dear friend of mine. I've known him for 30 some years. He's, he was a, a crazy wild man biker. This guy could bench press 500 pounds. He was just a gorilla monster. And yet he got that way out of fear of being bullied. You know, he was bullied all of his life. So he, this is the way he fought back. Yet he was such a kind, gentle person. When he became a Christian, he was the biggest teddy bear I'd ever known. Just, you know, <laughs> just filled with a, a, a tenderness towards people. Now, he and I both had an operation at the same time. Same type of operation, same day, same time. Everybody was telling all of us, both of us, you know, boy, you guys are, you guys are key players. You're strong. God's going to use you in the end times. You're going to pull through. We need you. Everybody needs you. You know we need you. And he had all the right answers to everything, too. And we kind of checked with each other before I had operations. It was the same day, same operation, same time. I lived. He died. Uh. It was heartbreaking. But the thing is that when we have an appointed time and when our time is, it's going to be. So even though in his life, his eternity was assured, he knew where he was going, but he didn't know when. And it was his time. And... Um, that still doesn't answer my question. Oh, 
<clears throat> about how two times you said during your talk, yeah. and I did this just to have a question about it later. I copied it down. How you said that when you return, you're going to review what happened. So your faith in that is unusual to me. I think it's a delightful idea. I'm just wondering where in your travels or your experiences or your imagination, and I don't want to insult you by saying that. Sure, no. Where you, where you got that from? That thought that after your life, you would be able to return, review things that happened that are a mystery to you during okay, your life. Okay, well, okay. In, in 1996, I started fasting and praying. I had a very bad experience. My ministry had broke up. It was through a division. Um, I lost my faith for about three years, you know, just gave up on everything and, and uh, pretty much just isolated and secluded myself. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was during that time that um, I came back. God actually spoke to me and says, remember what I told you back in 1978? And it was just about the Genesis 6 paradigm. I said, yeah. And he says, well, now is the time. Had you not departed and lost your faith, you would be on this program right now explaining everything that I'm willing to tell you. Are you willing to, to go forward now and listen? And it was at that moment that I came back to my faith. I said, Lord, forgive me. I want to do whatever you're wanting me to do. And then I began fasting and praying. And this lasted for about um, three months. I started a prayer book. I took notes from dreams and visions that I was getting. So imaginative or whatever. I mean, I'm trying to understand it from your point of view that, you know, this sounds probably just as strange as some of the UFO stories that we've been told. So, and I, so I don't take offense because I understand you're trying to understand something from being outside of the experience. Yeah, so yeah. for me, for me, this time during fasting and praying, I received visions, dreams, and then from that, I, as a scholar, I would go back to the original languages and, and find scripture prayerfully. Lord, where does this fit into your word? And I would find scripture. This was the foundation for my book, Beyond Science Fiction, that I wrote 24 years ago, which now, I mean, I'm talking about quantum physics, about space time, the, end, the idea that the end times means the end of linear time as we know it, that the earth is hollow, that's a biblical sound doctrine, that there's entities in there. My gosh, the Nazis escaped it, uh, to a base 211, made contact with, with these entities. There's an alliance there. Most okay, of the technology yeah. that we have, you know, yeah. I mean, all of these things were in the scriptures and I found them. I wrote this 25 years ago. I never thought I would live to see the day when these would be the hot topics on every documentary, every, um, um, gosh, even in the history channel. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's not even just on, you know, sci-fi channel or anything. So You're in your everywhere. glory. You're well, you your know, glory. the thing is, I wrote about this 24 years ago and my, you know, I was the David Icke of... <laughs> of Christianity back then. I'm the guy that's way out on the ledge, you know, talking about kooky, crazy things. Now, all of a sudden, it's the hot topics everywhere. And everybody, even though I could show uh, my fellow Christians chapter, text, and verse where this is in the Bible, because now they see it on a documentary on TV. Oh, man, Wilson told me that 20 years ago. I thought he was nuts. Now it's on TV. Oh, it must be true. So, I mean, it's just so crazy how what credibility what we learn, sources. How yeah. we learn and yeah. how things develop. We're not prepared for it very often. Exactly. You know, the, the investigation is one thing, but learning and glimpsing that as a result of whatever an investigation is for you anyway, is probably well, pretty amazing. I think the one thing that all of us have is a shared uh, part of our character. We want the truth, no matter ugly and stupid or what crazy it sounds. That's why we're all doing what we're doing today. We're willing to break away from popularity. We're willing to be estranged. We're willing to take on that loneliness, the isolation that we have. Because we want what's true. We want what's real. And we don't care about taking the, uh, what, the red pill and going black into the matrix. We want to we see how ugly the, the blue pill is going to make things. But by God, we want the truth no matter what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that's, and that's something that we all uh, share in our character, I think. And that's what we all have in common and what we're all you know, looking for. So we look at it at different lenses. But we're looking at the same thing, trying to make sense out of all of it. Yeah. W wouldn't you agree? Well, it sounds like you're an investigator, and uh, I'm you a die, you want to say I, that. I want the truth. I agree with that. Yeah. I, I, I would agree with that, too. Mimi, is your camera working? You want to show yourself? Uh, no, not really. But um, okay. I'm really enjoying the talk, Jim, and uh, I agree with you that we do all have that in common, for sure. We're looking yes. for the truth, and uh, and it really ostracizes us from the rest of 
from the rest of society most of the time, but hey, we found each other, right? Hey, more. <laughs> yeah, Poor little see. puppies. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I've I've always I, probably a lot of you maybe same way, but I've always been one that when when the crowd is going in this direction, I'm over here somewhere. I'm not going to follow the crowd, but because you're going in this direction, history's always shown me that whenever the crowd goes, I need to stay safe and get away from you guys because you're you're kind of like the blind uh, sheep that have taken the red that's pill. Certainly, and you're that's certainly in, what's happening today. Yep. That's oh my goodness! Certainly, what's happening? Today. Have you noticed the world seems like it's turned upside down and inside oh. out? It's I mean, you know, without it could be without us, me, but... without <laughs> us, and we're yeah. not included. I feel I feel like I'm alone. You know, <laughs> know. like I'm not going to do that. Forget it. You know, I'll yep. play along with it, but I don't believe in it, and I'm sure many people don't. But well, I'll be damned if I'm going to put my foot in all the way. Well, some of the paradoxical things that we're faced with now, we've got, we have got. Um, Artificial, you know, our, our software and our technology to produce things that aren't even real are so amazing. It's fooling artificial intelligence itself. They can't tell what's real and what's not real. If we're fooling them, man alive, how are we going to know what's real yeah. or not? Did you, yeah. did you guys ever see that um, they faked out a Vatican, um, they faked out a, a gargoyle type of creature that hopped on one of the basilicas in the Vatican? And, you know, it's hopping around and every, and I mean, the doggone thing looks so darn real, but it ended up being, it was, they showed the animation step-by-step step what happened and how it happened. Now, Same here's the thing though, them. here's the thing though, we are having an integration of spiritual entities that are becoming tangible in front of us. I think CERN is helping to bring some of this crazy crap into reality. So most people are going, okay, now I'm thoroughly confused. What is real and what isn't? That's the plot that the elite are putting against us. They are making sure that we don't know what's real or what's not real. Because some of this stuff is and some of it isn't. There's they're nobody trying to trust. To, well, There's and that's, to trust. they're trying to generate fear. Yeah. This whole coronavirus yeah. thing. What is it based on? Fear. My God, we're already in a zombie apocalypse. All I got to do is go down to a big box store and see all the frightened people wearing a mask who are yeah. perfectly healthy. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's horrible to see. That's our biggest enemy is fear. Yeah. Fear. Yeah, uh, sure, okay. They're creating fear. People that are watching just nothing but network news, man, you're paranoid. I don't know how you can handle what you're being faced with. You have no hope. No. You're lost. You're you know, believing that this pandemic's going to last. That's our new normal. It may be yours, but it ain't going to be my new normal. You know, I hadn't watched television for months, and I got a hold of a television just recently. And the commercials are amazing. They're like watching... Oh. They're like watching movies. Right? They're just I amazing know. what they're selling. But that's the point. They make it so that they, they're full blown out to take you down the, uh, yep. the yellow brick road with them because this is entertainment. And what we have to do is shut our minds to the entertainment and look for any truth that we can find. And it's exactly. difficult. But you don't want to go. Remember how you said the crowd, you go the other way? You yep. don't want to go the way of the crowd. You want to go the other way, especially when it comes to anything that's broadcast other than what you can trust. And you can't trust really much at all. Complain, complain. And unfortunately, you know, you are so correct. And unfortunately, they paint a picture of you and I as being the crazies because, you know, and now look at, look at where some of the laws are going. They're trying to say that um, these people that speak out this way are uh, careless or reckless. They have a social disorder. If you have a social disorder, then you've got to get reoriented. If it's, they're trying to actually make this even a, a race situation as being a social disorder. Well, who gets to define it? The ones that are perpetrating it. Who, what are they going to say about us? You have a social disorder. You need to get reoriented. So they can put us in an institution for trying to speak the truth because yeah. we're the crazies. There's a lot of holistic healing uh, leaders in the holistic healing. We're natural, you know, uh, ways to cure things. Uh, look at the myth they're trying to make of hydro, hydro, hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. I mean, it's I been in. proven. You know, Have you, hey, down there, down the state, you're, where are you? Down the states, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, so, I'm in Detroit, Michigan. Yeah. Okay. I'm up in Vancouver. <clears throat> I went into my doc. First, I went to the uh, local pharmacy, London Drugs, we call it here. They told me it doesn't work and they don't have any for me other than with a prescription. So I then, and here I am, doo -doo 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 -doo, I'm going to go get some. And, you know, I don't talk to people that I'm going to go be, and I don't look at this and this, any news is going to tell me anything wrong. I go looking into the doctor's office. At first, they were going to give it to me. And then I questioned my doctor. I said, 
if you do give it to me, is there any chance that this COVID um, recognition or, you know, that I have hydroxychloroquine, is that going to come back and bite me in the ass? And then when I started asking these questions, he said, no, I can't give it to you. Yeah. Right? So he was going to yeah. give it to me under the table. Nobody know. And I should have trusted him. But now I became an official person. I, he had to deal with me as somebody who wanted hydroxychloroquine. And he would have to put it in his notes and it would make his life difficult, I'm sure. And as a result, I never get any. And that's here in Canada. And it so surprised me. I wrote a poem about it and I sent that around to friends. But I'm, I, this is the time to speak of such things, whether it's in well, your you country, in uh, Kenya or in Canada. It doesn't matter. It's happening all over. Yeah. And this agenda is encompassing and sinister, to say the least. Because your uh, drug laws are so more liberal than in the United States, uh, us Yankees have been using Canadian pharmacies to get hydrochloroquine all the time. I get you <laughs> We're doing it some. right now. <laughs> you I mean, probably could yeah. get you some. <laughs> Good. I, 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 my... I doctor for it also, and my doctor said you can't get it in Canada. Yeah. No. So I don't think you can. Said, no, absolutely. He well, believes it, actually, but. He, he He's supposed he to believe it. In Michigan, because of our governance, yeah. we can't get it here anymore either. Now, the thing is, if you know anybody with lupus, they've been getting it for years. They've been taking it. Yeah. Anybody with malaria, my oh, grandfather was taking hydrochloroquine. Laura Lynn at the my, speech the other day. Remember, Brian, at the speech, she got up on the top and we had a big lo no lockdown. Sorry for interrupting you, but we had a big low, no lockdown uh, uh, rally of 3,000 people. Brian posted today here in downtown Vancouver, and Laura Lynn has been taking hydroxychloroquine for 14 years for her lupus, and no doctor ever said there was anything wrong with it. So exactly. she is championing it through for everyone, and she should because it's all bull. She's a testament to how unsinister it is. Sorry my for, my yeah. grandfather, my grandfather got um, malaria fighting in World War II in the Philippines. Um, in the 60s, as a young kid, he was still taking it, working at Chrysler, but he was still taking hydrochloroquine regularly, all the time. That's 20-some years. He lived to be 98 years old. Oh, yeah, he had is. no problem with it. It's baloney. It's crazy. Tell people. Tell everybody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm telling you. I know. It's, it's, it's a drug that's, um, that, I mean, I've got it prescribed to me. I've, I've got boxes of it here. You can get, you can get it here. I can get you crates of it if you want, or go to Mumbai and you can buy boxes of it there too. Well, there's a it's cheap a, way to. That, that's a North American. That's a North American um, uh, myth thing where 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 drugs become some type of hot commodity because because there, there's I can tell I can tell you for certain there's no shortage of that drug anywhere. I've got six boxes here. If I walk down to the pharmacy without a prescription, I can pick up a I can pick up more than I can carry. So that, it's just the laws. Is, that is a, that is a drug company agenda. That, that, is, that is predominantly what you see in North America. Is I'll tell you how I get my low dose sure. solution every day. I go to a, uh, a beer and wine store and I go oh. get Schweppes. I go get Schweppes. Um, oh yeah, with the- uh, uh, Yeah, the- Quinine? Quinine. No, yeah, quinine. the Schweppes has a higher concentration of quinine than any of the others. I mean, you can get Canada Dry or the other things, but Schweppes has the highest level of quinine in it. So I take mm. the Schweppes quinine, then I take, um, I get it at, um, you can get a Walmart or GNC. I get a, a big box of, um, uh, it's magnesium, zinc, and calcium all mixed together. And you take three of those with an eight ounce bottle of quinine. There's your hydro hydroxychloroquine. I mean, it's a, a cheap version of it, a mild dosage of it, but something's better than nothing. So if you don't have anything else, you can get that. And sometimes you can go to the dollar store and get, you know, some of the things uh, when it's available. So it can I be think, bought, you just got to know where to get it. Yeah, but I think that wouldn't be uh, as, as legal as it could be for the authorities not to give you the vaccination. They would say, well, we don't believe in your bottle and, your, and whatever you get. Well, from I'm going to tell them I don't believe in your vaccination because well, I know where it came from and I know who's selling it. I and know, but me. your argument doesn't count for yeah. much because it's only you. You know that. Well, yeah. That company, Mon Monderna, that is going to be um, the official company that's going to – you. Uh, promote you know the uh, the final vaccine moderna moderna is part of ig farben do you know who ig farben is guys yeah they're in yeah. germany right well and the crazy thing about it is that um 
IG Farben is owned by George Soros. Yeah. And what he did was he took IG Farben and broke it up as a conglomerate, you know, corporation, and he broke it up into certain little elements. So one of the elements is Mondera. It used to be IG, IG Farben. So one of, one of the people that actually got their whole exposure to understanding uh, viral and bacteri bacteriological warfare was um, a colleague that worked for George Soros and Moderna, and that was um, Boucher, the, you know, the official for the CDC and the World Health Organization. So Boucher cut his teeth on working for Mondera. And he brought his buddy, his high school uh, dorm buddy in on a deal. And his high school dorm buddy was named Bill Gates. So there's oh, the, three, the three stooges right there, man. One, two, and three. They're all working together to destroy America. Agenda 21, not just America, the whole world. You know, the Georgia Guidestones it happens to be on a 33.3 degree latitude line, which is more than a coincidence. I'm sure you guys know about that, too. It's like... Oh, I uh, didn't know it was 33.3, the Georgia Guidestones. The first yeah. one to tell me that. Yep. Thanks. Oh, yeah. my gosh. And oh. they, they, yeah, it's just... A, oh, it's just a coincidence. Uh, it to do yeah, with, it's just a coincidence. Uh, ah. Yeah. It has nothing to do with all the other stuff that's on the 33.3 degree line. No, of course not. <laughs> we have a bunch you know, of that in Vancouver. We, we have a, a bunch of it uh, here, of the uh, Masonic places and the buildings that are on that uh, 33 um, lateral, I guess it is. Yeah, well, you know, the whole, the whole idea was a 33 point, or 33 degree was the highest level of human attainment to knowledge. Anything above that is from a supernatural entity or being. Uh, whatever, whoever that might be. And this is, you know, their belief system. Well, it's funny that if you continue on due east on the 33.3 .3 degree line, you end up on top of Mount Hermon, um, which is um, an elevation point and a geographical location that the Bible says where the fallen angels of Genesis 6 first uh, landed on earth. Uh, and now in Genesis 6, what we call the Genesis 6 paradigm you know, there was a, a supernatural intervention by these entities, beings, the sons of God, who came in and produced a, started producing a hybrid race. They started messing with human genes. They started messing with space-time. They even, you know, underneath the pyramids, we find uh, pools or rivers of mercury. Um, these locations of all the pyramids happen to be on an electromagnetic intersecting grid line, you know, that surrounds the Earth. Believe it, guys, I found scripture to describe all of this. Just as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. All the activity that happened back then, and there were two main things. There was, um, they were having a deeper understanding of space and time and dimension and traveling it. And genetics, where they were trying to perfect a kind of a hybrid human, part human, part um, alien type race. So these are the activities that we see going on today. And it's nothing new under the sun. It happened before. It's happening again. My Twilight Zone. I just don't understand why we're necessary. If this is such a higher level of attainment and intelligence, why are we involved in any of this? Why do they have to support our interaction on this earth? Why can't they get rid of us? Or, or you know, somehow, are we necessary to them too, for their self, for themselves to grow and to survive or whatever? We're, we're necessary for them to usurp and overthrow God. And that's what our role is. That's what they're trying to manipulate us to distort and destroy God's creation by making an imitation that's contrary to his creation. So, I mean, but see, you're thinking too much. You can't, you're not allowed to do that. Don't, don't ask those kind of questions. It, it means you're onto something that they don't want you to know. Oh, you did. No, I love it, man. <laughs> yeah, well, you did it too. I know. See, iron, iron sharpens iron, man. When we get together like this and we can talk and share, you know, uh, information, boy, that's when we, that's when we start finding things out. Because yeah. you'll have a little piece, you'll have a little piece, you'll have a little piece. If we can get over our theology, our doctrines and, and beliefs, and look at it saying, hey, look, we're look, trying to look at the same thing. We're trying to figure it all out. Let's get together and work as one. And you know what? We're going to get an answer. And that's the way God works. And that's the way mankind is. We're forced to that. God's people never did anything good until they got into unity. All of a sudden, when they're in total unity, then they start 
working and figuring things out. But even on a broader scale, that's the only way we're- That's a good we point. I'm glad you said that, Jim. And yeah, the Bible does have a lot of wisdom. It refers to higher realms, Elohim. The Bible, Bible's got a lot to offer. Right. And it's good, like connecting the docs, like you should, sharing information, connecting with each other in the space. That's part of the whole philosophy of the UFO meetup group. You know, that's kind you of know, fun. Right on. Kind of fun too. There's, there's a book. I have a question. Uh, I wanted to know if um, the scripture that you're citing, if you are connecting the uh, Anunnaki with the Genesis 6. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, the Anak the Bible calls them the Anakim, but they have the same, um, li okay. linguistically, they have the same, they have the same um, language, uh, root word, Anak, and they have the same backstory of something that came from heaven to earth and now lives underground. Oh, geez, that's the Anakim. I mean, yeah, it's in the Bible. I, I know who they are. And they're not good guys. They're not good guys. They're really, really bad guys. But yeah, it does. And I have another question for you. And that is, um, I have a lot of trouble with the, with the Archons. And uh, I've been uh, sort of, in my own research, I've been putting the Archons together as being the Rays. And I was wondering if you have studied any of that. Yes, I have. And, you know, you're, you're right on there that there is a correlation there. And I believe um, I can't give you a total answer, but definitely there's enough of a, a similarity. You know, it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, talks like a duck. You mm. can name it whatever you want, but you know what? It's the same entity. We just call it different names from different backgrounds. But, you know, we're looking at the same entity. Yeah, I totally agree with we would We would call it the biblical <laughs> Kosh. And that entity is very, very different from the Anakim. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you know what I find interesting is that there's four main. We would may, maybe say four main alien types. There's the anacrid, uh, you know, the the mantis type. There's the reptilian type. There's the gray dolphin type, and then the humanoid um, um, Anunnaki type. And uh, in in the Bible, there's four main angelic orders and types. One mm -hmm. is an anacrid. One is a serpent, a uh, reptilian. One is like the gray uh, Nakash, and the other is the, um, the Nordic types. So, I mean, they line right up. So, so again, it's like, you know, whatever you call it, name you call them, they're still the same entity, and we're looking at it from different, you know, perspectives. You know, one of the best books I've ever saw about the escape of uh, the Nazis to a base 211 in the Antarctic was done by an occult scholar. Oh my gosh, what is an ordained minister, read, a Christian minister, reading an occult scholar's book? Well, you know what? The thing is, good sound research and scholarship, I don't care where it comes from. I, not, I may not agree with the premise and the conclusions, but here's some good sound research. Why am I not going to pay attention to it? This is the gold that's buried in all the dirt. And I mean, I can go through Christian theology, the same thing. Here's a nugget of truth, but it's buried in all this dirt. So we dig out the dirt and find the gold and let's appreciate it for what it is. And it doesn't matter where the source came from. Here's some good, solid research. This is information everybody needs to know. Just because, you know, we, we too many times because of our differences in beliefs, we want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If we just mm. forget that part and recognize good, sound research for what it is, man, let's add that to our chest. And the next thing you know, we got a quiver full of a complete answer. But we'll never yeah. get it if we don't have an open mind to to accept um, good research for what it is. Good research. That's the way I look at it. And I think you know. I I think we're this world is getting so crazy. It's causing all of us to say, okay, we agree on one thing. This is this is a way something needs to stop. Something yeah. needs to get together. We need to get together. We need to get some answers because this is yeah. just fruit loopy to the point it of it is. Craziness. Yeah, it's it's not it's not real, but it's true. We have to make that truth real. It's just we haven't approached it enough so we know enough about it. But exactly. we will. We just have to do it before we disappear. Hey, since Brian's there, I wanted to ask Gons, I wanted to ask you about the dumbs in Australia. They're talking about how Trump has got forces down there and they're cleaning them out. Who is, I mean, who are all these people that know this information? You must have heard of it. Is it, is it real? Because they're saying that there's, there's a psychic that I was listening to a video and she's talking about all these little kids that are bred underground for the yes. aliens. She yes. says it's just horrific what she's seen. And, how, and this stuff, I don't care how scary it is. We have to clean up people taking yeah. advantage of other people. I don't care 
if it's the Joneses up on the hill or somebody else, we have to come to a common goal. So we're not one killing each other or eating each other for God knows that's how little I know, but it sounds like these things are happening. This has happened all throughout history. The elite have, they're, they're not deviating and doing something new. They've done this all the way back, all throughout the Bible. There's a, a time on, on, on the top of Mount Hermon during the divided kingdom. Uh, Judea was in, you know, in traditional Jerusalem and they, they did things as they had done for all of their history. The 10 Northern tribes in rebellion went up north. They started doing everything on top of Mount Hermon on the 33.3 degree line and they caused their children to pass through the fires. Now in the Hebrew, literally what that meant was that they were putting them through a sacrifice and eating and drinking their blood. Jesus said, unless you drink my blood and eat my body, you still have no part of me. Now he was meaning figuratively of what he was, the sacrifice he was gonna make. So Satan does everything in the same but opposite to mock God. So on this sacrificial ritualistic thing that goes probably all the way back to the Tower of Babel, they practice these things up on the mountains and they would literally eat the flesh and drink the blood. But it's Satan saying, oh, okay, he liked it. You know what? I'm going to have my people actually do that, and it's going to be a mockery to you. So we're going to, we're going to go uh, ahead and do this. So uh, to Baal, to the Baal and Molech, um, this is what they did in sacrifice. So this is not anything new. This is what's been happening all throughout history. And the thing is that because we know they're real from a, a, a biblical perspective, um, man, I don't know if you guys know this one or not, but look up uh, Dr. John Trump and look at the story of him. Dr. John Trump. That's an easy name. Oh, and you know, the thing is that he's directly connected to Nikola Tesla. Oh, yeah. You know I what? Love, let, me, let, me, let me tell you a little bit of the story here then on this. Oh, yeah. Go for Doc, it. Dr. John Trump was a theoretical physicist in the late 30s, the government, the United States government, was working on a project trying to make x-rays a reality. They had a government think tank. Now, I don't know how long this was, but I know that they have been working on it for quite some time. And they realized that they were at a stalemate. They had the formulas, but they couldn't make this one formula work, mathematical formula work, to make x-rays become a reality. They couldn't get this, you know, worked out. So they said, you know what we need, is there any other theoretical physicists around that we can maybe bring in some new blood and uh, new eyes to look at it? So they brought That's in fine. Dr. Donald Trump. Oh. In three days, he had figured out the mathematical formula. Now, all these people had been working as a think tank for a long time trying to figure it out. Three days, he had the solution to the formula and had everything figured out. Boom, we got x-rays and he made it work. So all of a sudden they said, okay, this is our top man. This guy took three days and what we couldn't do with the world's best of the best, he's our best. So when Nikola Tesla died in 1943, the American government illegally seized all of his patents, all of his uh, notes, everything. They had everything going all the way back to the 1890s on all of the uh, experiments that he worked and everything. Guess who they called? Their golden boy, Dr. Donald Trump. Doctor, we found all these calculations and different things. We want you to look through them and tell us whether there's something to be concerned about here or not. We trust you, just go ahead and, and figure it out. Now, Donald Trump, I mean, Don, Donald, Dr. John Trump knew that they were probably going to weaponize this technology. He did not want to see that happen because he was already aware that if you stood in between two towers of, um, um, oh, Tesla's machine. Yeah, Tesla's Tesla's coils. If you yeah. stood in between two of them, you could see past, present, and future all at the same time. He knew that, and he knew that. You know what? We can't even control the here and now. What in the heck is the military going to do if they can control past, present, and future? Oh my God, no, they can't. Do it. So what he did was he purposely said, "Now there's, you know, when they got back with him, they said, well, you know, I looked through the formulas. There was a lot of gibberish, and so I just really, burned them." No, he they you know what they said? Uh, he says, "Well, do you want me to send this back? I mean, what what arrangements do you want? Now nah, you can keep them. It's junk. We don't need it." Good. Do Doctor John Trump kept every note, every patent, everything that Nikola Tesla ever had. He kept it all. Now, that did was he, in. Uh, did let's he see, destroy that, it? No, he kept all of it. And then he right. realized when he was getting up in his ears, he said, "My God." somebody could find these notes 
and they could utilize this. I need to give it to somebody I trust, somebody I know who loves America, somebody who I know would be faithful in the sense of history, somebody who doesn't want history altered or changed, somebody I can trust. So he went, to his, he went to his favorite nephew who oh. knew, loved this country, who he had helped raise. So he raised him to, um, to appreciate the free enterprise system and how, it would, how it's been great all throughout history. And that was his favorite nephew was Donald J. Trump. So he Donald has J. access? Donald J. Trump has everything that was ever written by Is that Trump. how he's doing the dumbs and whatnot? You better believe it, my oh, friend. Oh, you're smarty, yes. man. Yeah. Yes, he's got it. He, I think he was uh, a man that was appointed for this time, not only for a supernatural spiritual sense, but also in the physical sense. Who could be trusted with that kind of technology that would keep it to make America, to make the world free from the elite, to make them free from everybody and everything. It was Donald J. Trump. So it's wow. just like going to a doctor. We have to trust the, the medical, physical doctors, but at the same time as a Christian, we can believe in the supernatural healing. God can work through both. And sometimes he uses a combination of both. And I think God had called this man, Donald Trump, for this time and for this season to not only know, he came in not believing in and having any faith in God, really. Matter of fact, there's a scripture in um, Amos 3, 7. It says, I will not allow anything to happen, anything on this earth, until I have spoken to my servants, the prophets. Servants, the prophets, means somebody uh, that is, has a serving attitude, somebody that is not just a, I mean, you can turn on YouTube and you can find all these fruitcakes that call themselves prophets. But when you check out their personal lives and their agendas, they haven't done anything except talk their mouth and they're just talking garbage because they've never really done anything. There's other prophets who have been a servant. Uh, David Wilkerson is one. Um, he founded uh, Life Challenge, which used to be Teen Challenge. He has helped people be um, come out of gangs and from uh, cross addictions all over the world and literally has helped people get set free from drugs and from crime um, by the millions. So, I mean, there's somebody who's consistently a servant and yet someone who's faithful and can produce some good results from what they did impacting society and helping mankind. So these are the kind of people we look for. So beyond the kooks, there's two people who had prophecies about Trump going back into the early 90s. One of them was Kim Clement. Now I'm uh, from a Pentecostal background, so we believe all the supernatural stuff. We're the ones that are always made fun of too, by the way. But um, this was even strange sounding to me. So he's playing in, and he's jamming rock and roll but he's prophetically singing out prophecy as he's jamming. And so ah. if, you, if you forget about the appearance and how funny it looks and listen to what he's saying, he said, he said two things, one thing about Detroit and one thing about um, Trump. He said Trump would be a trumpet. He would come in whispering the name Jesus, but something would happen and all of a sudden a challenge that he faced so good that everybody would be forced to say, to acknowledge what he has done for the country and what he's done for mankind. And so he says, Trump will come in whispering and he'll be a man of hot blood. So, you know, we didn't, uh, like I continually say, look, we weren't electing a pastor. We were lucky electing somebody who wasn't part of the good old buddy system who actually was willing to take a step down to move into a smaller house, the white house. And then he gives his payroll away to the homeless and to charities and, and everything. He doesn't even take a paycheck. I mean, I see all these other politicians, they come in as a judge making a judge wages and they leave me being a multimillionaire. I'd be more concerned about where in the heck did they get their money and how did they get it? Because you, you're not supposed to do that according to our constitution. Mm -hmm. But who obeys Nancy that Pelosi. anymore? So, <laughs> yeah. There's a good well, example. <laughs> but many, many, like, yeah, many, many. Um, so well, that really bolstered my opinion of Donald Trump. And there's a girl up here, I mentioned her the other, a little bit, she was in the big rally we had, only 3,000 people, it is Canada. And uh, she got up on way up high on these oh, uh, columns above everybody. And she started out her speech almost at the beginning saying, you know what, I, I have to admit, I love Donald Trump. I'm gonna show as Laura Lynn, she's the one who's the hydroxychloroquine person for 14 years. I'm gonna show her this video. I think she's gonna get bolstered by it. Wonderful. Wow, that's awesome. You know, the thing is that, that um, there's so many different, um, uh, the other guy is called uh, Mark Taylor. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Uh, if you, um, he's on Amazon Prime, his story about how he was called. Now, 
you know, he was a fireman and he failed to get this one kid out alive and he was beating himself up with guilt and just, you know, really just torn apart. And uh, he was praying for some answers. And instead of getting an answer for the situation there, all of a sudden he's getting all these prophecies about Trump being president of the United States. This is long before he was even running for president and that he was going to have two terms and it was going to be um, an opportunity. Something was going to happen. It was going to be an opportunity for him to, to literally be able to make America great again, to bring back the old traditions and the things that, that um, biblically based more sense of morality that, that once did make America great, bring us back to a uh, constitutional government that obeys um, all of the laws and first and second amendments. Yep. And, and all these things that were, uh, once made America great again. So we're seeing this all happen. The majority of Americans are buying it. They're believing it, but they're laying low. They're not saying it. You know, myself, I got, I, I don't have any stickers on my car because the neighborhood I live in, I don't want my tires slashed. I really can't afford it right now to have damage done to my car or my car windows broken or anything. And probably in this neighborhood, if I did, they would. So all of us Trump supporters are laying low. We're not saying a whole lot yet. But when it comes election time, he's going to win. There's no if, ands, or buts. He's going to win by a landslide, a whole huge so. landslide. He, right he will. It's been prophesied, and I, I believe it. Here's, there's no doubt about it. There's going to be such a force. Um, I, I even wonder if Biden is going to make it to the election time. He's probably got, he's got a date and appointment at Gitmo. Most of these people are already under house arrest. You'll never see them a, a, a picture of them below the waist because they're wearing ankle bracelets, because they're already been indicted. And they're going to go for a military tribunal, and, and most of them are going to probably get the death penalty. Oh, there's a purge coming. These guys are not taking over like they think they are. They think they're winners. I peeked in the Bible in Revelation 19th chapter. They lose, we win. The reason we win is because we have an active part and a role to, for us to play in this too. Uh, and that includes all of you guys too. I mean, you guys got your eyes open, and you know what's going on. And because of it, I pretty sure that most of you are willing to pay the price to make sure that that truth prevails so you got an active role in this we are the ones that make the elite lose and they don't win because we have an active role to play in our own little part in our own little way and collectively they don't make it we're studying that's why i tell christians i said don't don't be afraid man they lost and they don't even realize it yet we've won how come you don't realize it yet there's a scripture in uh Ecclesiastes 3.15, it says, um, everything that is has already been, and everything that will be has already been, and God requires an account of that which has passed. That's my Twilight Zone scripture. That means that everything is, God's outside of time. He already sees the beginning from the end. The first word in the Bible is in the beginning. The last word in Revelation is the end. The beginning to the end is there in the scriptures, all of mankind's history is totally recorded. And guess who wins? Those that put their faith and trust in Jesus. Those that did their part to defeat the, the powers of the world, the rich elite, these baby-eating, blood-drinking, horrible monsters are going to lose. They're not going to be winners. So what are we worried about? I mean, um, I like Alfred E. Newman is my alter ego. Remember the little character on Mad Magazine? What, me worry? Mad Magazine, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's my alter ego. What, me worry? I don't got anything to worry about. <laughs> we already won. These dummies just don't realize they've already lost. You know, I feel the same crazy. way about the law, law of karma. I have some trust in that. Well, you in, were exactly. talking about how, um, like, a lot of you fall just say there's um, good aliens and bad aliens, 80 varieties of aliens, and that are the aliens are working through our governments of various countries, like the reptilians are probably working through the Rothschilds. You want to comment on the highest power system on earth don't you think aliens are working through governments or controlling government oh absolutely and it gets worse from my perspective but it gets even worse if the bible can fill in the gap and reveal who these characters really are guess who's got infiltrated all of the all of christianity there are certain things that are not taught here in the west that ought to be taught and i can't understand why well i can now we've been warned in the book of jude that there are there are those entities that are clouds without water, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, wandering stars who's reserved everlasting darkness. You know, that's three definitions for fallen angels, not humans. They look like us. They're walking around like us. They're a form without substance. They've already been dead once, and now they're back, raising hell again on earth. And they're wandering stars who's reserved everlasting darkness. These are entities that look like us, 
they're clandestinely intertwined into our society. They're going to hit all the highest levels of everything. But the most important thing that they would be concerned about is that the Bible can reveal who they are for what they really are. So all of our institutions have been infiltrated, all of them, including my um, denomination or whatever. Um, it, they've, they've raised hell. But here's the thing. There's a, a promise of a revival. It's going to start in a particular geographical location, which Detroit. Do you know that we are the only city on the entire planet that so far has not had anything burn? No, nobody's got broken glasses and windows from cars or vehicles. Nobody of any form of violence has happened in Detroit, Michigan. This is the only place that it hasn't happened. There are reasons why. For 40 years, there's been ministries, black and white, who have been working together um, decade by decade. We have a Democratic police chief. Um, uh, no, Demo I'm sorry, a Democratic mayor in Detroit. He was voted in by the majority of blacks. He's a white guy. Um, there were people running from uh, office who were um, civil rights iconic leaders. The black community didn't vote for him. They voted for this white guy because he actually lives in the city. Uh, most of what happens usually is they'll have a fake address where they got, you know, like an appearance so that they can actually be mayor of Detroit, but they actually live out in the rich suburb somewhere. This guy moved everything, his family and everybody, into the center of Detroit in a neighborhood that other people would say is dangerous. <clears throat> but everybody recognized, hey, man, this guy's like one of us. He's really sold out to helping the city. He really cares about us. He's a white guy, but he cares about us. So they voted over the other things for him. I've worked in programs for uh, Dugan. I won't vote for a Democrat on this planet. The only reason why is because as long as they're still on an agenda that thinks it's okay to kill babies, I can't vote for you. I would support this man, and I do right now here on this show. This guy is awesome. He doesn't care about what you believe or what you think. If you're willing to help make Detroit great again, come on board, man. I don't care. You know, let's, let's work together. Let's help. That I can respect. When we got a police chief, this black guy, um, they paid him $250,000 a year. I'm going, that's outrageous. But I'll tell you, that guy gathered up black and white and some of the old guard, you know, white cops and everybody and says, look, some of you are dirty. You were hired to protect and serve. And you guys, some of you are dirty. You're involved in a lot of organized stuff. This is all going to end. In my watch, I'm going to give you one chance. You come clean, you start actually serving and protecting, or we're going to get rid of you. I don't care who you are or how long you've been on, you're going to be gone. If you're willing to meet me and be honest and change, I'm going to keep you. But otherwise, I'm going to replace you because we can find plenty of other people that would love to serve and protect. You are going to start serving and protecting. You're going to take care of this community. This community is going to take care of you. This guy, when one year proved that he was worth more than $250,000, write your ticket, man. You are one guy that cleaned up the garbage in Detroit because it was horribly corrupt. Now, that's why nobody burns anything. One thing you never saw on the news, eight mile was like the black and white line from suburbs to Detroit. I live on 12 mile on Gratiot, which is the main street going right down to you know, Detroit. I'm only four miles away from where this happened. And believe me, I was a little nervous that night standing on there waiting to see what was gonna happen. Nothing happened. As a matter of fact, when the police formed a human barricade of the police along eight mile road, and they said, you're not going any farther than this. Antifa, which was a bunch of millennial white kids wearing red scarves to signify who they were, were actually an international group of communists dedicated to the overthrow of, of uh, capitalist countries from within. They were trying to agitate. Do you know what happened? The general population of Detroit, the blacks, joined the police in the human wall and said, no, we love our city. We love our mayor. You're not going to go any further than this. And they blocked off Antifa and wouldn't let him pass. Now you didn't see that on the news no. and you never would because the fake news doesn't want that. That's against, they want civil war. They want burning cities. It didn't happen in Detroit. And the line stopped, but it stopped because there is such a connection between the police and the community. All of a sudden, like the, the, the police chief, I can't think of his name now, but he, he was on the TV and he was saying, look, in times past when we had uh, racial problems, he says, we couldn't, we had to stick together because the man was never going to give us a fair shake. He says, those days are over. We're all the same. There is no barrier of color anymore. You are the man. Quit trying to protect something that no longer exists. 
You need to turn in your neighbors when you see them doing crime. You need to not be afraid that you're gonna have anything come back on you. We are here to protect and serve you. So they finally understood it. In Detroit, that's a message that is unified now. The police love the community, the community love the police. That's the way it should be. Blacks and whites don't see, God did not die for um, any particular race, but the human race. And we all are part of the human race. So that's what matters in, in life. God so loved the world, he died for everybody, not just for a select few. White Nazi, black Nazi, brown Nazi. No, Nazis are Nazis. Will you guys go off on another dimensional planet and fight amongst yourselves and leave us alone so we can live in peace? And that day, I think, is coming. There's a day of reconciliation. There's a day, Mark Taylor called it a reset. This world is spinning so crazily out of, out of the sight that there's going to be some kind of event, a reset. And I think I, I got it in my book. I, I think I've explained it. I couldn't even begin to explain it here now. But there's going to be a time of accountability. There's going to be a change. Uh, a time of uh, a transition where if you, whatever you've reaped, um, like you were saying before, um, Brian, what you were saying about um, karma, it's reaping and sowing. What you reap is what you're going to sow. So yeah. if you have re reaped good things, this, is, this transition is going to be like heaven on earth. If you're Nancy Pelosi or George Soros, I don't think I'd want to be in your shoes. It's going to be a literal hell on earth for you. It's not going to be fun. So I, I think for us, everybody here, it's going to be a time of excitement. It's going to be a time of finally seeing justice for all the craziness that's been going on in the world. That's my hope. I think that's what we're about to be on the verge of. Everybody else can be frightened and scared. I'm looking like a kid on, on Christmas waiting for the good part to happen first. The other bad part happens, but that's on the last half. It's like a pendulum that swings one extreme. I think God's trying to show the whole world. You know, when my people are in charge, I can bring life out of death. But, you know, when the other guy takes in charge in the very last half, except these days be shortened, no, no flesh should be saved. You guys are going to screw everything up so bad, you're going to bring it to total destruction. So, you know what, I got to intervene and stop you because you're just like way out of hand. What he does for, for all life everywhere in the whole cosmos, he's so showing, look, my judgments are true. These guys are going to spend their eternity in hell. Why? Because they don't get it. They never have, they never will. Look what I did. I put my people in charge. Wonderful. I put them in charge. They destroy everything. So do you get it now, cosmos, uh, universe, whatever? I really got to do what I got to do. These people don't get it. They never will. They got to be separated with their father, the devil, and they can just have fun in a lake of fire for all of eternity because that's what they sowed and that's what they're going to reap. Us, however, now we get to have fun for all of eternity. And that's going to be great. So. Uh, you're a breath of fresh air, right? <laughs> well, I, I hope I'm just helping you get prepared. You don't have to be so frustrated, angry, or, or you know. Are all things, those things depressed? Yeah. Oh, we are. Um, I mean, it's futile. Yeah. Everything is futile. Like uh, the future is futile. What are we going to do? You might as well just give up now. Maybe, I, maybe there is hope. Who knows? Well, until I understood what I believe for me is the plan of God, now I can just go, oh, man, I'm glad you're in control because it sure is nobody else is in control. <laughs> so it, it does give a hope. It gives a hope that there is going to be a good end to all of this. And and accountability. And uh, I think all of us here in this, you know, we don't have anything to be afraid of. We're trying to do the right thing. We want truth no matter what it costs and we're willing to pay a price for it. And I think that's what's awesome. And it's, it, for me, it's, a, you know, I'm excited to be in company with you guys because um, I just think a lot of good things are going to come from, from sharing, you know, with one yeah. another and, and grabbing what is good and working together on that. Jim, I have a question. It's Mimi here. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I was raised, um, I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. So I was one of those kids that goes out and preaches with the Bible in my hand. So, um, you know, I, I read the Bible back and forth many times, and I still find a lot of good in it. Um, and, and, and you are really actually giving a lot of hope. However, there is a part in the Bible that says, you know, kind of says that they're going to win for a while because it says that no one will be able to buy or sell who doesn't have the mark. So we all know now that the mark is going to be that uh, ID 2020. You don't want your camera on? Maybe we saw you a minute no. ago. You don't want your camera on? Uh, well, the problem is I couldn't get on with my computer. Oh, and that, I am holding the phone, and it's yeah, it's quite weird. Before. 
It's kind of uh, hard to talk while you're holding. Yeah, I get you. I, yeah, it's really, really, really hard. I'll try. Okay. You're there. You're there. It's, nice, it's nice to see yeah. you. Yeah, it's nice it's, to see you. My arms, start, my arms start shaking, and then, you know, and then it's hard. So, um, the 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 thing is that um, it's it says that we won't be able to to buy or sell without the mark. Right. So, you know, I want to know what your opinion on that is. If we don't take the mark, if we don't take the vaccine, and I think a lot of us are starting to see that it's going to be pretty violent for us and maybe jail and all kinds of things if we don't want to take the vaccine. Um, and, and you're right, we might have to, to you know, we might have to um, be accountable for that and we might have to actually have to be punished. Um, but. So what what do you feel about that part of scripture where it says kind of that they're, that they're going to win Good question. for a while? And Should we take the vaccine? Yeah, I say no. But what do you think? I say, I say no, but yeah, but too. you know you're giving a very positive outlook that we've already won. So my question is, what about that? What about you know that part? In, in the Bible that predicts that we won't be able to buy food, buy or sell, trade without the mark. Like what do Christians uh, do? You know, what, what, what do people who are, who are um, in the resistance do? 